It's been a big, big break between the last time I spoke to a camera and uh, and now, not including the singing bits. It's it's a weird thing when I talk to a camera and don't sing. It 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 it's quite cringy for me. So I <laughs> so I don't I haven't. I'm back. I'm back. When I was a teenager, the walls of my bedroom were covered in photos of my favorite singers. Today I'd like to talk about this one and this one. They weren't the kind of singers you'd turn on the radio to hear. Um, their recordings were a bit hard to come by and required pilgrimages to elderly collectors, which was no bad thing. Belle Epoque opera divas were my girlhood princesses. Their glamour was jaw-dropping and their stories were real. Today I'd like to talk about uh, two sopranos who were so fabulous that they owned their own castles, which they earned through hard work. I might talk about two others next week, depending on what I look like in this. There are so many to choose from. So I'll start with Adelina Patti. She was born in Madrid. Uh, her parents were musicians and they had her touring America at the age of seven, singing on tables so that people could see her. In those pre-microphone days, this sort of treatment of a young larynx could ruin a developing voice, but somehow hers survived and flourished and became known for a stamina and a power that while filling large halls retained a sweet, warm purity. Her brother-in-law, Maurice Strakosch, was one of the first masters of PR, sending stories ahead of time to the newspapers in the towns she was to sing in. One report had it that the secret of her sweet voice was a sandwich containing the tongues of a hundred nightingales eaten just before bed. In another story, she had given a concert in Mexico City and a dozen slaves were brought onto the stage in chains as a present. According to the story, she rushed up and tore the shackles from their wrists and ankles, proclaiming loudly that she was giving them their freedom. They kissed her feet and the audience rose and demanded another song. Ah. <sighs> those olden days. Another story which is apparently true uh, was that she had a mechanical bird that she placed on her breast. I love the way they put things back then. Waking up in the morning to wind it and to sing its high notes and trills. Royalty all over Europe festooned her with jewels. Diamonds, emeralds, rubies. She bought a uh, castle in Wales called Craig Inos and lived there with her husband. A tenor called Nicolini, who always called her a Madivina and frequently spoke to her on bended knee. Guests to the castle were expected to bring floral tributes, which a footman in silken stockings would receive, leading them through a long greenhouse full of shrieking cockatoos and parrots swinging wildly on their perches. Dinner was always formal, bejeweled and attended by rows of footmen. Signor Nicolini would always taste everything on her plate before she ate it. Finally he died, maybe that's why. And Adelina married a baron. They hired a special train to London for the 15-course wedding feast. She made a few records in her 60s, um, but she'd retired. And the primitive recording techniques really don't do her justice. And um, I don't know. They're not as bad as people say. I, I find that the sweetness and the warmth is very much in evidence. And if you imagine the sound, if you imagine an echoing theatre sort of for that voice to nestle in the middle of it's it's very beautiful it must have been magnificent it's almost melancholic at the same time as being very very pure of course there are many books on patty and so much from the newspaper archives of the day my favorite accounts of her are through the eyes of other singers of the time they can be quite catty, as well as adulatory. Um, Blanche Marchese's autobiography, um, A Singer's Pilgrimage, has a, a rather wonderful couple of pages on Adelina Patti. The castle of Craig Inos is still there and they put on operas and productions and artistic events. I once had the opportunity to sing a role in one of the operas, but not only it didn't pay money, but you had to pay to be in it. So I said no like the logger's daughter that I am, which apparently was a very bad move. 
as that's actually how things work. Oh well. Emma Calvey's father was a railway labourer and she didn't have the money or the education to enter a music conservatory. Hard work, talent, charm and again stamina made her the star that she became. She, like Patty, was a favourite of Queen Victoria. Apparently Queen Victoria chatted away in the uh, Provençal French dialect that Calvey was most comfortable with and laughed whenever Calvey's peasant upbringing showed through in breaches of court etiquette. Calvey was a mystic and part of the turn of the century French esoteric scene, a lover of occultist Henri Antoine Joubois, and later on a Martinist, adding the initials SI after her signature, which stood for Supérieur Inconnu. She was always keen to discover new things. She admired the work of a sculptor who used wet cloth to drape over his models and decided to bring this technique to her stage characterization of Ophelia, only to find that when the stage lights of that time shone on a wet dress, she was hidden behind a cloud of steam making the audience think that she was on fire and nearly causing a riot. She made a pilgrimage to the Sistine Chapel to meet Mustafa the eunuch to learn how to sing a special kind of high note that only he knew how to produce, which she called the fourth voice, ethereal and strange. Yeah, it's like it's disembodied. Emma also travelled the world with Swami Vivekananda, who brought yoga to the West. Apologies for my pronunciation of him. The lasciviousness and reality of her interpretation of Carmen, her probably her most famous role, was too much for many critics, including, including George Bernard Shaw, who said of the death scene, to see Calvey's Carmen changing from a live creature into a reeling, staggering, flopping, disorganized thing and finally tumble down a mere heap of carrion is to get much the same sensation as might be given by the reality of a brutal murder. It was the de desecration of a great talent. I felt furious with Calvey. If you want a good time and you're stumped for something to read, Try and find George Bernard Shaw's Music in London. It's in three volumes and it's all his uh, his critiques of his, his criticisms of music of the time, of performances in the 1880s in London. And it's fabulous. <laughs> I much prefer those to his plays. They're great. So full of character. I mean, that's that's pretty typical, that quote. He, he takes it very personally. But in terms of in interpretation, uh, great divas back then did their own interpretations and if they thought something looked good on stage they'd do it. Directors didn't tell them what to do. So Calvey actually she had many different ways of interpreting Carmen and it depended on which performance you went to. Sometimes she was very fatalistic and gothic and sometimes she was uh, light and frivolous and, and, and coquettish. There's an account by, uh, in the 1930s that I read, uh, a retired diva was re remembering when she was in the chorus and Calvey had come along to do Carmen and apparently Calvey took it into her head to grab a hand mirror from one of the chorus girls and, and spend a good while uh, looking at her own body, every contour of it, indecently, uh, during the tenor's solo. When Calvey's ship came into Honolulu Harbor, she was greeted with a fleet of balloons floating over the city, each with her picture on it. She was carried through the snow in a red velvet dress by loggers in Canada. She sang for coal miners in Pittsburgh and was crowded by cadets in St. Petersburg who unharnessed the horses of her sleigh and pulled her to her hotel. She performed Carmen's dance and arias to the harem of the Sultan in Constantinople and sang for maimed and dying soldiers fresh from the trenches of World War I and retired to, yes, a castle. Unlike Adelina Patti, though, she was no good at keeping her finances in order, she didn't marry any barons, and she gave much of her money away to the poor. She tried to earn some cash in American vaudeville in the late 20s, her voice rather like her castle, by then a ruin. She was forced to sell the castle, the Chateau at Caprière in Aveyron, before World War II, and by most accounts died in poverty in 1942. 
She never took recordings seriously and they're quite hilarious. It's said that the London Gramophone Company had to put the money they offered her into gold coins and throw them into her lap to make her come to the studio. Where you can hear her exclaiming over the bad piano playing and generally having a gay old lark. Highly recommended. Her autobiography entitled My Life. In fact, you could pick up just about any autobiography of a diva from this era and have a good time. I mean, for my money, autobiographies. I take nothing away from biographies. They're uh, witty and loving and scrupulously researched, but uh, if you want this stuff from the quirky women themselves and the writers they paid to take down their extravagant histrionic dictation, it's the autobiographies. I mean, sometimes these women really stretch the truth, but this is their truth. Flawed, fascinating, and, and fabulous. I'll get to all of these, I think. Ernestine schumann Hank, amazing. Adelina Patti, we spoke of today. Emma Calvey, spoke of today. Nellie Melba, Dame Nellie Melba. Melba Toast, Pesh Melba. And... Dame Clara, but definitely get to them all. If you like me to. This autobiography of Calve, I found as a teenager through uh, a, a book finder. The days before the internet. And you wanted a book that was out of print. You contacted a book finder. No obligation to buy. But if you did, they were expensive. It, it took a lot of watering neighbors' lawns and taking care of neighbors' pets to afford this. This article, tucked away into, the, into this book, says Calve would reunite earth and heaven. Singer aims by her projected school of music to start world harmony. That sounds like her. This is from uh, the New York Herald, 1923. Other stories around it. After this story, it says a spider first used the diving bell. True. And on the back, it says... Ku Klux Klansman coming into the open. Oh, dear me. This remarkable and unusual photograph reproduced above shows hooded members of the George Washington clan. I, I, I don't think that Calve would have approved fact, I know she wouldn't. <laughs>